So now what we need to do is we need to correct that 16 shift reduce conflicts warning. The simple way we do that is we give precedence to our multiply and divide and our plus and minus operators. So the way we do that is we create a special variable in ply called precedence and we set it equal to a special tuple. Within that tuple we create two more tuples and we create the first element called left and we set that equal to plus minus. So these are our plus and minus tokens and we say left once more because we want our tokens to be left associative and we say multiply and we create another one called divide. This means that divide and multiply have a higher precedence than plus and minus and if you're aware of the order of operations you'll be aware that multiply and divide are done before plus and minus. So this allows our parser to parse things correctly. It removes the ambiguity in the grammar because ambiguity in your grammar is what causes these shift reduce conflicts. They're not errors necessarily, they're just conflicts in your grammar which means it's got some ambiguity and by doing this adding precedence to those operators we have removed that ambiguity. So if we run this again you can see the shift reduce error is gone and now all it says is we have two unused tokens and we haven't created the error function yet. We're going to create another grammar rule. We're going to say a calc can also be, can be an expression or a calc can be a variable assignment. So we'll say a var underscore assign which is a non-terminal. Var underscore assign is what we're going to use to create variables. We'll say def p underscore var underscore assign. And we will say a var assign is equal to a name followed by an equals token uh, followed by an expression. And we'll also say a name equals a name. This means that a variable can be equal to another variable or a variable can be equal to the output of an expression. But it can't be an empty which is up here because that would make no sense. And here what we do is we create another tuple which is going to be uh, part of our tree and we say a p0 we want to create a tuple and we're going to call it an equals which means a sign and we're going to pass it the variable name which is as you can see is this is p0 this is p1 so we'll say p1 whoops and we're going to pass it the value we want to assign which is going to be either a name or an expression and these are p3 in our tuple so that should be that let's just let's just run that Okay, we have an error in our syntax on line 65. The reason we have an error is because instead of having the colon, we should have the or, which is just a straight line. Uh, run that. Now if we say 1 plus 2, we get that tree. And if we say a is equal to 100, we get that tree. If we say a is equal to b, we get that tree, which is correct. If we say a is equal to 1 plus 2, we get a is equal to the output of 1 plus 2. Uh, and this hasn't actually done anything yet because we're not evaluating our tree. The parser just builds the tree up using the grammar rules we specify. One thing you'll notice though is if I try to say 1 plus a, we'll get an error. We have a syntax error. We can't include variables in our expressions. So we'll fix that by saying, copy this, paste it here. We can say expression underscore var and we'll say an expression is equal to a name. And we're going to just create another tree, call it a var, and we'll pass it p1, which is the name. So now if we run this, we'll get no syntax error. So the reason we've got this error is actually quite simple. What we've done is we've said an expression can be a name, but what we've done up here is we've said a var sign is a name equals expression, or name equals name. But we've essentially said an expression can be a name as well, which means we've got two rules that look like this. So what we'll do is just remove name is equal to name because a name can be an expression. And that will actually get rid of our error. If we just run this again, we have no error now. We just don't have the, uh, the error function defined. And if I say a equals 100, we have that. If I say 1 plus a, we also have that. And now we have no syntax error. We are very nearly done with our parser. We just need to create another function, which is the one that's causing the error, this p underscore error function to get rid of the error that we're being shown all the time. So we say p underscore error p, and we'll just do something simple like print syntax error found. And now we'll just run that one more time. We can You can see we have no errors. If we just say one plus two, we get that. If I say, one plus an at sign, which isn't a valid character, uh, we'll get a syntax error. You can see it says illegal characters and we find a syntax error. So there's our parser done and what it does is produce trees that we can now evaluate. 
So the way we evaluate the tree is we go up here to the top and instead of just printing out the output, we want to run the output through our run function. So we just pass run around that. Now I'll scroll down here and I'll say def to create that run function. And I will simply just say print p. So let's just run that and we will say 1 plus 2. You can see we get 1 plus 2 printed out. We get none printed out because we're printing 1 plus 2 here. And then what we're doing is printing out the output of our run function, which doesn't return anything, so we're just getting none. So that's where we're getting that. And in here, I'll just put in the two greater than signs and run it. You can see it looks more like an interactive interpreter like we get with Python, for example. Uh, if I do it like that, I say 1 plus 2, we get the same thing. So what we want to do is we want to say if type of p is equal to tuple, then we'll do something else, we'll just return p. So the reason we're saying that is because if it's a tuple, which means if it's a var, or it's an expression, or it's a var sign, it's going to be a tuple, uh, which means we have to do some extra processing. If it's an int or a float, it's just going to be a regular um, integer or float, which means we're just going to return that to the run function because the run function is going to be recursive. So we can say if p0, and if you scroll up here, you can see p0 is this plus sign here. If p0 is equal to a plus, then we want to say return, and we don't know if this one or this two is going to be an expression that requires further processing. So we have to run it through the run function again, even though it's just going to be returned back in this case. So we say return run p1, which is this first parameter. And then we say plus return p2 through the run function. Plus run p2. So let's run that. And what we should get, if I say 1 plus 2, we should get 3. And you can see 3 is printed out. If I say 1 minus 2, we get none because our run function doesn't know how to interpret that. So we're just going to copy that. Say so LF is equal to a minus. We just want to do the same thing, but in reverse. Um, LF, it's a plus. LF, it's a, a multiply, actually. Uh, we want to multiply them together. And finally, L if divide, we want to run that through the uh, divide. So let's just run this now. We'll say 1 plus 2 times 4, and we should get 9 printed out to us. You can see we get 9 because our calculator knows the order of operations. If I say 1.2 plus 2.4, you can see we don't get... 3.6 quite exactly because we're using Python's numbers. If I just quit that and I say Python 3 and I run this through Python 3, we'll get exactly the same result. That's just the way floating point numbers are stored in the computer. We lose some accuracy. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, and subscribe. In the next video, we'll be finishing off, hopefully, and that will be us creating the variables and assigning variables and locking up variables and things like that. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.